Hello, my name is David Kelly. I'm the Executive Director of the British Chamber of Commerce here in Singapore. And a very warm welcome to all of you for today's webinar looking at the 2021 Singapore budget. Following a challenging 2020 uh, that I'm sure you'll all agree with, um, where the Singapore government rolled out five fiscal packages supporting businesses in the wider community, Singapore recognised its first annual contraction since 2001 and the worst recession since its independence. Earlier this week, on Tuesday the 16th of February, literally around 48 hours ago, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Mr Heng Sui Kiat, delivered Singapore's 2021 budget statement. The theme for the 2021 budget, emerging stronger together, with the three key enablers being innovation and enterprise, financial capital and human capital. In this session today, we will be looking at a high level thought of the budget for businesses, along with the general views of how the budget can shape economic recovery. There will be a, uh, an opportunity for any questions to be answered, so please do post your questions into the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screens, and these will be addressed following the presentations. So without further ado, I am very pleased to now welcome Salvatore Di Chiara, Head of Accountant Management at our friends at Hawksford, who will give a short introduction of our speakers today. Um, Salvatore, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining us and over to you to begin the session. Hi, David. Thanks a lot for the introduction and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Salvatore Di Chiara and I'm the head of the account management department in Singapore and I will be moderating this event. Uh, today we will focus with our, the help of our panelists to see how the economic was hit by the COVID-19 pandemic and how the economy is looking to bounce back in Singapore. And then we will focus on the main measures introduced in the Singapore budget with a particular focus on the personal income tax implication. So without further, further ado, let me introduce our first speaker today is Mr. Ravi Prasad. Uh, Ravi is an economist at the British High Commission in Singapore and is also part of a wider of economists, network of economists covering Southeast Asia. Uh, Ravi presentation will be focused on the, how the Singapore economy was hit in 2020 by the pandemic and how the economy is look, looking to bounce back now. Uh, I'll leave the floor to Ravi now for his presentation. Thank, thank you for that introduction, Salvador, and thank you to the chamber for, for inviting me to speak today. So, so yes, I'm Ravi Prasad. I'm an economist at the British High Commission here in Singapore. And in the 10 or so minutes that I have, I just want to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour on some of the key economic trends we saw in Singapore in 2020, and then give a bit of an overview as to some of the main, main themes coming out of the budget um, on Tuesday. Um, so thank you, Helen, for getting up the slides. Um, flick to the next slide first, please. Um, so just to set the context a little bit, 2020, as we all know, has been a really tough year for the global economy regardless of how you cut it, regardless of which metric you look at. Um, it's been um, a depressing year economically. You know, it's the biggest global recession since 1929. Global GDP fell by around 5% last year. FDI flows down by over 40%. Trade flows down by over 10%. And a number of sectors continue to be hit hard. Um, put a couple of charts out there that, that, that illustrate some of these trends quite nicely, I think. So the left-hand chart looks at FDI flows. It segments it by type of economy, developed economy, transition economy, developing economy. Um, we see that across the board, FDI flows have decreased, but it's more pronounced in the developed economies versus the developing ones. And then the chart on the right looks at um, trade flows, um, segmenting it by North America, Europe, and Asia. And again, across all three regions, we see quite considerable declines in trade. Asia is shown by the gray bar at the top. So we see that Asia, comparatively speaking, um, didn't do as badly as, as Europe and North America. And of course, as a, as a highly open economy, Singapore's trade to GDP ratio stands in excess of 300%. Singapore was always going to be affected by some of these um, trends in the global economy. And I think that segues quite nicely into, into the next slide. Helen, please. Perfect, thank you. So um, 
the headline GDP numbers for Singapore last year, um, Singapore declined by 5.4%. Now, that was the biggest contraction that Singapore has suffered since its independence in 1965. Um, and I think, you know, the, the chart in the middle there, which looks at quarter on quarter growth, shows that in the second quarter in particular, um, coinciding with circuit breaker measures, that was a really tough quarter for Singapore with GDP declining by over 13% on a quarterly basis. Now, we sort of fast forward to the second half of 2020, we do begin to see that pick up. So a negative 5.8% quarterly growth rate in Q3 and then negative 2.4% in Q4. And in totality, that amounts to um, an overarching fall of 5.4% in 2020. And I think the important thing to stress is that this is much better than what some had been expecting for the Singaporean economy. So even the government's own predictions have predicted a worst case lower bound scenario of negative 7% last year. Um, so negative 5.4 is, is some distance above that. I don't think that would have been possible without um, some of the fiscal and monetary measures you saw the Singaporean government put in place over five budgets last year. So the, the fiscal stimulus package amounted to something like 20% of GDP over five different budgets. Um, you have the, the Ministry of Finance estimating that around 150,000 jobs in Singapore were saved as a result of that fiscal stimulus package. And the Monetary Authority of Singapore um, saying that without the package, GDP falls could have been as high as 12%. Um, so um, the chart on the right hand side just uh, breaks down that growth rate for the entire economy across different sectors. And what again we see is, is a very, very varied picture sector to sector, supporting this idea of a K-shaped recovery. And, and when I say a K-shaped recovery, it's sort of um, uneven across sectors. Last year, you saw manufacturing and finance and insurance being quite resilient, um, posting positive growth. Um, the only other sector to post positive growth was um, information and communications, but then everything else posted declines. And towards the bottom end of that chart on the right-hand side, you see construction, accommodation, and transportation all seeing declines of uh, in excess of 25 percent. Um, next slide, please, Helen. Thank you. So this slide just unpacks um, the Singaporean growth numbers in a little bit more detail. Um, I'll start with the chart in the top right hand corner, which looks at the manufacturing sector specifically. Um, so as, as I've already mentioned, the manufacturing sector really was a star performer in 2020 for Singapore, representing something like 20 percent of GDP. The sector grew in excess of 7 percent. Um, some of the bigger drivers there were biomedical manufacturing, again, perhaps a little bit unsurprising given um, we're in the midst of a pandemic and there was a surge in demand for medical equipment being produced in Singapore, but then also electronics. Um, the electronics sector in Singapore, which is the biggest cluster within the manufacturing sector, um, really did benefit from drives towards digitalization and home working, but then also from larger global trends. So the push towards semiconductors, particularly in the electric vehicles space. Um, and just coming down to the chart in the bottom right hand corner. So this looks at fixed asset investment in Singapore. And interestingly, last year, we saw a 12 year high in fixed asset investment in Singapore. And that comes in the midst of a global pandemic and when global FDI flows have declined by 40%. So that kind of resilience, I thought, was quite interesting. Around 80% of that number that you see for 2020 is made up by foreign companies um, investing in Singapore. So again, I think it's just highlighted even in the midst of a pandemic, the importance of Singapore as a hub um, and sort of the belief in Singapore as, um, as a country that can weather the pandemic well and serves as a gateway into the region, that belief is still there and if anything has become stronger. Um, and then just a chart on, on the, uh, the left hand side, this looks at the unemployment rate and how it progressed through 2020 in Singapore. Um, so it, it certainly increased the overall rate, the resident rate, and the citizen rate all increased through 2020, reaching a peak around September, October 2020, where the citizen unemployment rate was around 4.8%. And um, that represented a 16 year high. Um, so the previous high was in 2004 when Singapore was recovering from the SARS epidemic. Um, but what we do see is towards the end of last year, particularly in the final quarter, November and December, the unemployment rate began to trend down again as some of the measures Singapore put in place, particularly the jobs growth incentive, but then also some of the, the measures put in place to make it slightly harder to hire foreign talent, um, having an effect on the overarching um, um, unemployment rate. So that started to come down and we expect that to come down through um, 2021. Um, next slide, please, Helen. 
Thank you. So that brings us on to the budget um, that we heard two, two days ago. So it was titled the Emerging Stronger Together Budget. Um, and the centerpiece of this budget was an $11 billion COVID-19 resilience package. Um, so this package amounts to a predicted fiscal deficit in Singapore for the next financial year of 2.2% of GDP. Um, and that is quite considerably smaller than the deficit we saw last year, which was 13.9% of GDP. And so the chart on the right hand side tries to illustrate this. Yes, Singapore still is running two consecutive budget deficits in a row, but the, the budget deficit, the predicted budget deficit for 2021 is considerably smaller than what we saw for 2020. And so in terms of some of the high level themes we saw from the budget, so we saw a move from broad based support across different sectors in the economy towards more targeted sectoral support. Um, so there were extensions announced in the job support scheme, uh, tier one sectors, aviation, tourism um, and aerospace. We'll continue to see wages being subsidized through until September. And similarly for tier two sectors, albeit to a lesser extent, retail, arts and culture will all benefit from extended uh, wage support. Um, in addition to benefiting some of these hardest hit sectors, um, Singapore announced a further uh, $900 million for a household support package um, to go with some measures that have already been put in place last year. Um, so yes, there was certainly that near term support um, that featured as part of the budget. But I think one of the differentiating features this year was um, that, that that coincided with long-term support as well. I mean, I think Singapore really sees an opportunity to double down on some of the, the efforts it's been putting in place over the last few years to really prepare its economy, as the Deputy Prime Minister puts it, for its next lap of growth over the next five to 10 years. Um, so again, the, the, the main element of that was a $24 billion fund over the next three years to promote industry transformation, including themes like digitalization, tech upgrading and reskilling. Like I said, some of these themes are not new, but it does feel that the 2021 budget really um, sort of added more impetus into some of those initiatives. So skills upgrading. So last year you had the, the, the United Jobs and Skills package in Singapore that was able to place around 75,000 Singaporean workers. That package has been extended with another $5 billion worth of funding. And similarly, I think another one of the key themes, uh, a theme that has been front and center of all Singapore's planning over the last year, two years is the, the theme of sustainability and green development. So key, key announcements coming out of the budget were $19 billion of green bonds that the Singaporean government will be issuing, um, an expedited roadmap to encourage electric vehicle adoption, but then also a higher surcharge on petrol. Um, so um, those are some of the big announcements. I mean, one of the other interesting things was um, even though they are running a budget deficit this year, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister of Finance was very keen to stress that this could not go on forever and post crisis, they have to return to balanced budgets. There'll be no GST increase this year, um, but the hope is in the Deputy Prime Minister's words for that to happen sooner rather than later, um, maybe in 2022 or 2023. Thanks, Helen. Next slide, please. So what, what does that um, sort of what, what picture does that paint for the overarching economic outlook in 2021? So the Singaporean government and indeed most commentators are predicting a continued gradual recovery um, in the Singaporean economy through 2021. Uh, the Ministry for Trade and Industry are predicting between four to six percent growth um, and Singapore's GDP will only really reach pre-COVID levels in the second half of the financial year at the very earliest. Um, I think indicators support that. So the chart on the right hand side um, looks at the composite leading index. This is, a, a, an this is an index comprising nine forward looking indicators for the Singaporean economy, ranging from PMI indicators to inventories to cargo handled. And again, in the final quarter of last year, we saw an 8% pickup in that index. So again, that, uh, a lot of the metrics are pointing towards continued ongoing recovery. Um, at the same time, there remain a lot of risks. I mean, the biggest economic risk, again, unsurprisingly, is the evolution of the pandemic. 
on the downside as we see new variants of the virus emerging, how uh, receptive will our vaccines be to those new variants. Similarly, um, there's no guarantee that Singapore will be able to uh, stop another uh, local outbreak for, from spreading. So, you know, the pandemic really does present the biggest downside risks, but also the biggest upside risks as well. If, um, you know, global economic recovery, uh, recovery takes hold faster than expected, that vaccine production, deployment and distribution um, is, is quicker than expected. And again, just stressing this point, Singapore is a very open economy, 300% of GDP uh, coming from trade. So if the major trading partners, Europe, North America, and China begin to see quicker than expected recoveries, then we can expect Singapore to benefit. At the same time, the recovery is still likely to, to be K-shaped. Different sectors will continue uh, to grow at different speeds. Um, the sectors that did well in the final half of last year, manufacturing, finance, um, IT, will probably continue to do well um, and benefiting from some of the tailwinds that I alluded to earlier. But at the same time, I think you know the, the downside risks facing things like aviation and aerospace, they're probably larger than, than what were initially anticipated even three or four months ago. By Singapore's own admission, it's had to slow the pace of border reopening. Um, but broadly, I think the long-term growth strategy, growth story for Singapore remains intact. Um, you saw that with the higher than expected um, FDI and fixed asset investment numbers, um, a lot of tailwinds coming from digitalization. And Singapore's really doubling down on its long-term initiatives around reskilling, green development, and premising itself as a sort of high trust location in the Asia Pacific, particularly important in the midst of continued geopolitical rivalry. Um, so I'll, pa I'll pause there. Thank you for listening and pass back to you, Salvador. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi, for the presentation and to show us how the Singapore economy managed to weather the storm in 2020 and is now looking to bounce back in 2021 thanks to manufacturing and uh, the French manufacturing sector. Uh, I'll now like to give the word to Ben. Uh, ben Housing is a financial service tax partner with Deloitte in Singapore and he also leads the Deloitte insurance tax practice in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, ben, I'll leave the floor to you for your presentation now. Salvatore, uh, many thanks for um, the kind introduction and to the chamber, many thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, much appreciated. Um, Helen, if you just pull up the slides, are perfect. So if you go on to the, the next slide. Um, so I, 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 I guess, where do we start with the, the, the budget from a corporate tax perspective? Um, I, I, the, the, one, the one point to note, which isn't on this slide, is um, there's been relatively few tweaks um, to the overall sort of corporate tax system in Singapore for a number of years. The rate has remained the same. Um, at 17% for, for many years. It's one of the lowest in the region. Um, and we've actually seen the trend for uh, group or sort of economies and, and, and nations to reduce the corporate tax rate. Um, but that's starting to reverse. So we started to see that reverse in um, other jurisdictions. So the UK has canceled um, certain rate reductions. The US obviously has just reduced its rate very recently with um, some of the Trump tax reforms um, and Biden is talking about increasing the rate. Um, so we, we're starting to see sort of economies now think about and countries thinking about do we need to increase the corporate tax rate and one of the questions that's going to be seen here in Singapore is um, is Singapore going to have to increase the rate when we come back to Ravi's point about a balanced budget so tax uh, we, we, need, we can't be running at a, at a deficit for, for forever. Um, and is that going to be one of the, the, the keys to change um, and to move things? Um, that might be further impacted um, by some of the international tax changes that are due to occur over the next few years. Um, so there's still a significant amount of debate and um, discussion going on at the OECD level and at um, sort of the international level with regards to um, what some are calling BEPS 2.0. This is a fundamental reform of um, the, so the international tax system, looking at two things. Um, one is looking at um, taxing rights and who has the, uh, who has the power to tax um, and which jurisdiction should um, be sort of taxing um, certain types of businesses. Um, and in particular, these are sort of um, digital businesses, um, likes of certain, you know, the Googles, um, the Facebooks, the Netflixes, et cetera, of this world. 
um, and we're seeing sort of uh, already a start of people raising digital services taxes. Um, and then the other is looking at a global minimum rate. Um, and that might put pressure on Singapore and um, Singapore's um, sort of um, incentives regime. Um, and so we could see a change and um, the Deputy Prime Minister signaled that, that um, they are looking at these um, international tax rules and developments closely um, and monitoring them because uh, they, they may need to change various elements to that. Um, with regards to sort of what was actually in the budget, um, in the budget was um, extensions to various um, measures that were made in 2020 um, around um, a um, extending the option to accelerate the write-off of the cost of plant and machinery. So that effectively enables um, groups to take deductions for capital expenditure earlier than otherwise uh, would be the case. Um, similarly, that is the option to accelerate the deduction expenses incurred for renovation and refurbishment. So again, um, both are useful um, um, sort of measures, but only if you're making profits. Um, if you're loss making, those measures um, have will not have sort of immediate value to you. Um, with regards to the extension of the carry back um, relief scheme, um, again, that's been extended. Um, question with regards to that is, um, could the government potentially have done more? Um, so. Um, there is a cap on 500, sort of the, the amount that you can carry back to 500,000. So could they have increased that cap? Um, and potentially could they also have increased the number of years that so you could go back from the three years to say five years. Um, so again, that um, business, it may have been sort of more valuable to businesses had they been able, had the government been a little bit more generous, but given sort of the pressure around balancing the budget, um, there are other, well, clearly other considerations. Um, with regards to other measures, um, they've looked to maintain competitiveness and resilience of the tax system um, for, for uh, and done this through enhancing the double tax deduction for internationalization scheme. Um, so one of the things that they've done here is that, um, which people will find very welcome is, um, uh, as we're all aware, travel is a little challenging at the moment. So they've actually included um, um, sort of double deductions for attendance at virtual trade fairs and, and sort of um, being mindful of the fact that um, actually some of these events have now become virtual rather than physical. Um, they've um, allowed the automation support package to lapse but have retained the 100% investment allowance scheme. Um, that, um, invest, that, that sort of um, scheme has been extended um, for a couple of years and they've um, streamlined the eligibility um, criteria as well um, in regards to the investment allowance and energy efficiency scheme. Um, and um, it also included within that a reduction of greenhouse gases. So they've sort of extended it um, and enhanced it, which is great. Um, finally, um, the, the, the what they've done, um, they've continued um, to support um, the philanthropy and volunteerism. So they've extended um, the 250% deductions for qualifying donations. Um, again, a um, welcome measure. Um, question whether potentially they may have been able to do more um, given sort of the um, position that so certain companies are going to be in a lost position as a result of um, the current sort of economic environment um, because these um, qualifying um, donations aren't available for carry back um, and the carry forward period is only five years. So again, groups will want to and companies will want to make sure that they get full value for these schemes. So question again, um, could, was, it, was it potentially sort of a missed opportunity there? Um, and, and again, they've extended the business and IPC partnership scheme, which will be welcome um, to a number of companies um, and encourage the continued sort of working together of um, the nonprofit sector and the corporate sector. Helen, if we just move to the next slide. Um, there are some additional um, sort of refinements to um, the system um, and the various sort of release um, that are there and exemptions that are there for um, the financial sector. Um, if effectively, these all have been done to um, extend um, schemes that were due to lapse potentially, um, or to clarify 
um, certain um, points where um, they've, they've wanted to make sure that everybody is aware of the exemptions and to um, legislate for them. So this is all going to be welcomed. It continues to make sure that the financial sector and Singapore is a, is a hub for the financial sector. Um, the one point to note, again, which is not in here, um, was that the um, one of the insurance um, specific um, schemes for the IBD lapsed. Um, that that um, has now been subsumed into the wider um, insurance business development scheme. Um, I, I, given sort of the um, rate differential, so from eight to ten percent, um, and given the fact that there's a number of specialised insurers that are already in Singapore, and it's now mature um, and well established um, hub for specialised insurance. Um, we don't see that being significantly to the detriment of Singapore um, and actually some of the simplification may um, make companies um, life easier when it comes to the compliance. Um, if we move to the next slide. Um, I guess there's, there's also within the, um, within the budget um, some interesting um, non-tax related um, measures that will be sort of um, of interest to groups um, and, and to, to corporates. Um, the, the, and again, this, this, this goes back to potentially some of the changes that are coming through from a international tax perspective and looking at um, the, a certain minimum rate of tax. So um, to the extent you have incentives and to the extent you're able to, you're able to or, or double deductions, et cetera, in respect to certain amounts. Um, that puts pressure on your minimum tax rate. So the government is looking at moving away from having um, incentives um, and, and more towards grants and various other schemes to enable companies to take benefits. Um, and, and we're starting to see that through the measures that are introduced here um, and the, the, the various measures. I think sort of, it, 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 again, the encourage, the sort of, the, the 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 foresight that's there around encouraging digital innovation, um, encouraging say that the, the chief technology officer as a service um, to provide firms with access to professional um, IT consultancy. So I think that's a really interesting um, development by the government. Similarly, the the digital leaders program um, to help groups um, hire sort of. Um, core digital teams develop and implement digital transformation roadmaps. All of these are really um, interesting and innovative schemes um, that um, Singapore is introducing to try and um, ensure its competitiveness and ensure Singapore's um, competitiveness. Um, and, and what they've also looked to do is they've also looked to um, increase opportunities for um, some of the larger local enterprises um, with regards to their um, funding. Um, so to the extent that sort of raising funds in the equity markets is challenging at the current uh, at the moment or to the extent that groups don't want necessarily want to dilute um, control um, through fundraising at equity level, um, the, uh, the sort of the, the, the government scheme to um, effectively co-invest $500 million with Tomasek. So in a, in a $1 billion local enterprises fund, funding platform is really interesting and potentially gives um, these large um, local enterprises the opportunity to, to fund um, that may, not, may have been sort of more challenging for them to acquire and to really help them on their next um, sort of bound of growth. So again, lots of interesting developments that are there. Um, I'm not going to really touch on job support um, and creation um, measures because I think Kerry's going to cover them off in a little bit of detail and um, I want to give her plenty of time to, to do that. So um, if I hand back to Salvatore now. Um... Thanks, Ben, for your, uh, for your presentation and for touching on some of the points, uh, tax-related and non-tax-related measures included in the budget. And it seems like the Singapore government, DCS, had a more conservative approach and moving from an incentives-based approach to more uh, long-term approach to digitalize and innovate companies, so non-tax-related uh, uh, incentive. Uh, let's now move to our next uh, panelist is Miss Kerry Chang. Uh, she's a partner of People Advisory Services and Mobility 
at EY Singapore. Uh, she has gained significant experience uh, in providing tax consultancy and international mobility tax services within uh, Asia. Uh, she will be focusing more on the personal income tax application uh, of this budget, if any, and uh, on the uh, tax systems in Singapore, also compared to other tax systems in the, uh, in the region. Uh, Kerry, I'll leave the floor to you for, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Salvatore, and to the Chamber for the opportunity to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Chinese New Year. Well, um, you know, as a tax individual tax practitioner, I must say I was a little disappointed uh, that there were no announcements made on the personal income tax front. I mean, that really puts me in a bit of a spot as to what to contribute to this webinar. And I, and I reckon that many are not totally surprised by, by the lack of announcements um, on the personal tax front, because if we really take a step back and, and look at things from a holistic perspective. There is indeed um, a lot that has been already given to individuals and businesses alike in the past five budgets in, in 2020, um, dipping into reserves to help to cushion the effect of COVID-19. So I think the writing was already on the wall that this would um, be a budget where targeted help would be given to specific groups and rightfully so. You know, and of course, initiatives to help Singapore get ready for the time when we all emerge from the pandemic. Um, next slide, please, Helen. So I'll, I'll start off by talking about the, the personal income tax front and what did not take place um, during the budget. Um, I will summarize some key initiatives announced to help um, businesses retain their workers. Um, thanks for, for the, the stage for that, uh, Ben. And, and also hopefully speed up the hiring process, right? So thereafter, I would like to change tangent a little bit to just share some thoughts with you about looking ahead and what I think that we could potentially anticipate from the personal income tax perspective. In this region, there's always some level of competition between Singapore and Hong Kong. So I thought that I'll, I'll cover that off as well. Next slide, please. So during budgets, we, we always sit there and, you know, for the past like two, two, two and a half hours, you know, waiting for the minister to, to wrap up the speech and wait with bated breath for a good tax rebate. But sometimes, well, our expectations may not always be met. So unfortunately, um, no tax rebates um, were announced. So there will not be any tax relief from our personal tax bills. Never mind, we'll, we'll do, all do our part towards uh, nation building. Okay, so there was also no change to our personal income tax rate since the year of assessment 2017, which ranges from 0% to 22% for tax residents. These are, you know, remain extremely competitive in the region and certainly one of the lowest in the world. Next slide, please. So Minister Hing stressed a lot on developing the skills, the talents and creativity of our people and enabling them to have access to good jobs and, and opportunities. So as, as Singapore becomes a more digital, innovation-driven economy, um, highly skilled workers and deep talent is required. So extensions of various support packages were announced and I've summarized the main ones affecting businesses. So firstly, from the left, the job support scheme, JSS. So, you know, as mentioned by Ravi in his, in his, um, in his segment, it'll be extended for firms in tier one and tier two sectors by up to six months with more support for tier one. So this will, you know, certainly provide some businesses in, in hard hit sectors and the continued support will help businesses to retain core staff and focus on readying themselves for gradual increase in demand in their businesses. There is also an extension of the wage credit scheme for one year, but the government co-funds 15% to further support wage increments so companies can retain and attract local workers. Next comes the extension of the Jobs Growth Incentive or the JGI. This is a huge one, but the government allocating an additional 5.2 billion to the scheme. So the government had seen encouraging results um, in the first few months, first couple of months since the launch of this um, incentive scheme. You know, so um, the hiring window will be extended by seven to 12 months up until the end of September, 2021. So companies hiring eligible locals below 40 years old will receive support of 25% on the first $5,000 of gross monthly wages for up to 12 months. The support will be increased for the hiring of eligible locals aged 40 and above, PWDs, persons with disabilities and ex-offenders from what you can see on the screen. 
So important to take note that the difference is that while the JSS scheme targets the hardest hit sectors in tiers one and two, it's important to note that the JGI covers all sectors. So the extension of this growth, you know, this jobs growth um, uh, incentive will encourage employers not only to seek out new hires, but with conditions tied to retaining local hires, this will further provide job security for our workers. Next slide. The next slide just you know, summarizes the extension of other initiatives under the SG United Jobs and Skills Package that was first introduced in May 2020. There has been a good level of success where many people have been put into jobs, into traineeships, attachments and skills training. So the extension comes with you know, some slightly amended parameters with a focus on moving workers into growth areas. Next slide, Helen. Thank you. So I'm going to move away from the budget announcements now, and I have a quick summary slide on the COVID-19 impact or the COVID-19 effect, and, and just to share some personal thoughts about looking forward. So last year, Singapore spent um, almost uh, 100 billion you know, Singapore dollars through five budgets, and targeted support has been aimed at businesses to encourage recruiting and retaining workers, as well as alleviating costs to help businesses, um, you know, to alleviating costs to businesses to help keep industries afloat. Many things obviously need to be paid for: infrastructure, security, defence, healthcare, and support schemes for our ageing population and the needy. So it is and inevitable that there must be an increased source of revenue for the government to fund these and also to gradually replenish the reserves for another rainy day and for the next generation. So next slide. So what then can we expect in future budgets? I'm going to cover off some thoughts on three broad points. Um, firstly, GST, then wealth taxes, followed by personal income taxes. So well, well, there's one thing that certainly doesn't require any crystal ball gazing, and that would be in respect of GST. We have all been given ample notice of an impending hike of GST from 7% to 9% by 2025. Um, I think the Minister for Finance's words are, are you know, are kind of like ring in our ears. It's going to be sooner rather than later. Yeah. So in fact, the minister had also highlighted way back that our GST rate is not high by international standards, even after the planned increase to 9%. And indeed, the OECD average is 19%. Second point on wealth taxes, and whether I think you know the, that the government will levy additional taxes on net wealth, my personal view is that I don't think that's going to happen. I don't believe that the government will impose any additional wealth tax because it will likely run counterintuitive to Singapore's objective to be competitive. There are already a few existing measures in place. For example, property tax and stamp duty levied with higher amounts on second or investment properties and also to those who flip properties within a short span of time. Um, I found it also very interesting to read an OECD report, it was issued back in 2018, that many European countries have removed net wealth tax. And the key reason for that is really to do with inefficiencies and the administrative burden of collection. And more often than not, they found that it does not meet the objective of redistributing wealth. So the experience from some other countries as well is that um, capital flight risks are heightened when um, the tax burden on the wealthy increases. Therefore, these considerations would, you know, and must certainly weigh heavily on any policymakers' minds, since the government has been working to position Singapore as a hub to many sectors including the, the rise of family officers, attractiveness to entrepreneurs, and to manage a significant proportion of Asia's wealth. How then about capital gains tax regime? Again, I, I, my personal view is I don't believe this will happen, you know, as the absence of capital gains tax is really one of the many factors that attract foreign investors, and Singapore is well known for that. So given that Singapore's basis of taxation is based on a territorial principle, where taxes are imposed on income that soars within the territory of Singapore, it's going to be challenging to reconcile the introduction of capital gains tax with a deviation from current tax principles. So having said that, are we going to see a hike in personal income taxes? Next slide, please. So before answering that question, I thought I'd share some insights with you. So let's just have a quick look at Singapore's um, tax revenue collected in financial year 2020. 
So in the bottom right, you'll see that um, the individual tax income tax collection, um, well, it's the second largest contributor of tax revenue at 23%. Next slide, please. So just want to share some interesting statistics with you. Um, this table um, has shows the number of individual resident taxpayers in Singapore for the year of assessment 2019, their accessible income levels and the amount of taxes that were collected. Um, this breakdown for um, year of assessment 2019 is indeed the latest that's available from the IRS. So a few interesting nuggets, yeah? So only 47% of the resident population pay taxes. And if you were to see the first line in yellow, it shows that the largest group of taxpayers earn between $40,000 um, um, to $80,000 per year. Moving down the table, and we see another, we'll see another four lines um, in yellow. And the percentage of taxpayers in these four lines make up just under 4% of total resident taxpayers. But from this small group, the amount of taxes that they contribute amounted to more than 50% of the taxes collected. It's, it's uh, to be more precise, it's about 58%. Okay, so back to the question, will we see an increase in personal income taxes? I think it's a question of time before that happens. And likely it's going to be targeted at higher income or the ultra rich individuals. But I also reckon that with the rumblings and the grumblings among the population about GST increase, um, especially with the new announcements of GST being applicable to low value buys imported by air or post. Um, it could take some time uh, before a personal tax increase happens. I think the government needs to let the, the dust settle and, and just implement the GST increase first. In the past few years, we have already seen a few tweaks to the personal tax system, pushing it to a progressive one, where really the government's intention is for higher income earners to be required to play their part and to contribute more towards nation building. The design of any hike in the future will likely and intentionally avoid any impact on low and middle income earners. Next slide, please, Helen. So even with an increase, um, you know, perhaps in the, in the future of the top rates to say 23% or even 24%, I think it's unlikely to diminish Singapore's attractiveness to investors and businesses. Uh, on this chart, Singapore ranks second after Hong Kong. I mean, certainly, certainly in the region, um, you, know, um, the, you know, if the, the next country in terms of the top marginal tax rate in, in Asia PAC is Myanmar at 25%. Yeah. So Hong Kong um, admittedly continues to remain competitive uh, with Singapore, not only in terms of tax rates, but also as a, a gateway to the China market. We'll go in, into further comparison with Hong Kong on um, my next and last slide. OK, so next slide. So from a personal income tax perspective, Hong Kong rates are lower overall and Hong Kong does not have a capital gains tax regime. There is also no GST in Hong Kong. The government is also fairly generous with their one-off annual tax rebates. All these do contribute to lower effective rates in Hong Kong compared to Singapore. There has always been keen contests between both countries for dominance as Asia's best place to do business. And, but Singapore continues to fare very strongly with its political stability, strong government, quick and nimble ways to adopt business-friendly policies. I mean, the list goes on um, in, in terms of, you know, the many industry-specific tax incentives that continue to attract um, foreign investments and entrepreneurs to establish their Asian presence in this country. So with that, I'll pass the stage back to Salvatore. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry, for, uh, for the presentation. and. Uh, more importantly, also to give you uh, your thoughts or your insight on what the, go the government is going to do in the future as well about uh, uh, personal income tax. And just to give you an example, uh, I'm Italian and our lowest tax rate uh, is 23%. And it's, it's, it's higher than the highest tax rate uh, in Singapore of 22% for income above 320,000 uh, Singapore dollar. And thanks also for giving us this comparison between uh, Hong Kong and Singapore, of course, there has been a contest between these two uh, countries to establish as the main hub uh, in, in Asia. And, uh, but I think Singapore will play a very important role in the future, especially within the ASEAN region and not only China. Uh, thanks again for the presentation and let's move to our Q&A section. And I have a few questions for our panelists. Uh, I will kick off with Ravi. Uh, you, you briefly mentioned in your presentation that the approach 
in this budget was slightly different from last year's. It's more focused on the long term rather than immediate uh, effect. Is there something that stood out or that surprised you in the in the measures released and announced by the Deputy Prime Minister? Um, I mean, like you say, there were, there were certainly some, some differences between uh, the five budgets issued last year and the one budget that we've had this year so far. I mean, the Deputy, Deputy Prime Minister said that his main wish is that he doesn't have to issue another budget in 2021. And I think, you know, you're right in saying that one of the main differences was this balance of near-term support uh, versus sort of the more medium to long-term support, which we saw in the budget this year. Um, I think the, the other two major differences I feel were, were around scope. Again, I think as panelists have mentioned, the scope of this year's budget was far more targeted in those areas which needed that support um, more than other areas. And then the other element was around size as well versus last year. Um, so last year's budget ran a fiscal deficit of 13.9%. This year it is 2.2%. And I think, again, that is probably from all the signs that the government were giving prior to the budget, that was broadly within the realms of expectation, a, a more moderate uh, fiscal budget this year. Although that's not to understate the size of the fiscal deficit they'll be running this year. So even though it's 2.2% of GDP, that still equates to something like three times the average fiscal surplus that Singapore ran in the years 2010 to 2019. So it's still a significant amount in that regard. In terms of anything that stood out, surprised in particular, I mean, again, I think a lot of what we heard in this year's budget was sort of reiterating trends, policy focus areas that we've heard before, whether it be sustainability, whether it be skills upgrading, whether it be technological upgrading and digitalization. Um, I felt that was, was more a continuation and a doubling down of efforts as opposed to anything brand new um, and, and, and revelationary. Um, I mean, I think the one thing that perhaps did surprise me a little bit was how keen the Deputy Prime Minister was to emphasize this point about the need to return to balanced budgets um, sooner rather than later. He devoted an entire um, minute or two to talk about, you know, why uh, GST would have to be raised, talking about how Singapore's recurrent spending needs were on the rise, particularly with respect to Singapore's aging population um, and, and, and increasing healthcare costs. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think that was one of the key messages is that, you know, from next year, you can prepare, assuming the recovery gets on track this year is in line with the government's expectations from 2022 onwards, we can expect a little bit more um, belt tightening in Singapore. So um, that, that reiterated, reiteration of that message um, stood out to me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Kerry, I mean, you mentioned your presentation, of course, about the job support scheme and the extension of the scheme. And this is probably one of the main uh, announcements. Uh, the DPM also really mentioned it and highlighted the, in the presentation uh, that the employment landscape is completely changing and the COVID-19 uh, is going to even accelerate some of the trends, the new trends in the uh, employment landscape. Uh, how do you think the measures released will actually help Singaporeans uh, to develop new skills and talents that are definitely needed in this uh, in these times? Yeah, um, I mean, actually, the, the way I see it is, you know, Singapore has already been working towards upskilling our workers for years, you know, but with the drastic and sudden way, sudden change in the way that we work, we live, we do business, COVID-19 has been that, that probably that one impetus, right, you know, to just bring out that concept of reskilling and remaining relevant to the forefront and made a really big talking point, especially when workers are impacted with the reduction of, of income and, and the loss of jobs. So if I were to think about it and to look at it historically and moving along a timeline, I mean, we first saw the introduction of Skills Future Credit that was way before um, COVID. Um, I think Skills Future Credit was probably announced in 2015 or something along, along those lines. And we also had the Skills Future Enterprise Credit, which were aimed at providing support for individuals and businesses in, in developing that, that relevant and highly skilled workforce. Then the government's support for job redesign under the PSG, the Productivity Solutions Grant, has also enabled businesses to adapt 
and update their their workforce and processes. Um, you know, so you know, then what we saw was in the last four to five years, there's been a push from the government towards planning for a future consisting of a digital innovation driven economy. Um, you know, with a focus on job design, internal training and development to build the, the highly skilled workers and the deep talent uh, that is required. So the, the challenge here is, is really for companies and individuals to embrace the disruption and to focus on transformation, firstly, from a business perspective, and then very quickly looking at the skills needed for its workforce and what gaps um, or what gaps there are that needs to be filled. So it starts with the business to make a decision to transform and digitalize. And Ben mentioned a couple of initiatives that were very interesting, like the chief technology officer or the CTO as a service initiative or the new digital leaders program, which will provide the businesses with access to professional IT consultancies or support in developing and implementing a digital transformation roadmap. And then thereafter, it will then very quickly be a question of job redesign, um, upskilling the workers and perhaps bringing forward the plan to hire locals to take advantage of the jobs growth incentive um, you know and in fact there are a, a suite of measures under the SG United Jobs and Skills package like the traineeship the mid-career pathways and and so on and so forth so um, final comment I mean ultimately I do feel you know onus is on the businesses and the individuals to take advantage of the opportunities that are already there you know in in order to drive their competitiveness um, in in the new normal thanks Carrie Absolutely. And uh, you all, everyone talk about the uh, lack of uh, tax new tax measures released in this budget. And also the fact that GST will be increased sooner or later, but it is not going to be increased this year. Uh, ben, uh, is there any other tax measure that uh, you would like to highlight? Uh, for example, this GST imposed on low value uh, goods, is this something that su surprised you? I mean, um, I, I think that the, the, the government and, and IRAS have been looking at um, a way of um, trying to tax these low value imports um, and they've been trying to consider a way to do it. So they're, they're concerned that sort of um, as a consumer, we have an incentive to um, potentially part, purchase some of these, these goods um, from overseas. Um, because we won't suffer GST if they're under a certain value. So, um, for example, if you go on your online shopping and you you make sure your um, you, you, the clothes that you buy are less than four hundred dollars, uh, and then you um, and, and you get it sent from from Hong Kong or from Australia or from wherever, um, that's that. Um, whereas if you buy from a local um, supplier, or you buy from a local shop, um, there that 400 you, you're going to suffer that 7 percent gst so it, again it's it, it is this going to fundamentally change the revenue that is collected probably not it's not going to be a significant impact um but what they in terms of revenue but what they're trying to do is trying to level the playing field the issue then becomes on the administration um and they've introduced various measures around gst over the last couple of years which has now enabled them that they think to be able to do this um, and also we see this coming in in other economies. So um, we've seen this, um, this, this sort of um, uh, requirement come in for Amazon sellers into the UK and into other jurisdictions. So this isn't something that is new um, in it, something that, that we were expecting um, at some stage and they've just chosen to do it this year. Is it going to have a significant impact on revenues? Probably not. Um, is, it some, is, it, is it something that... Um, is going to really level the playing field. We'll see. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from our audience, and I would also like to invite uh, other attendees to write any questions in the chat box. Uh, so Mark is asking us, uh, did the DPM miss the opportunity to clarify the tax treatment of carried interest? And I would probably direct this question to, uh, to Benjamin, but please, uh, to all of the panelists, what do you think about this question? I mean, I, I think that sort of we've seen, we, we've seen obviously with Hong Kong and the introduction of the rules in Hong Kong, that being a significant, potentially a significant driver um, and um, sort of the ability to have carried interest being exempt from tax. Um, if you are a um, well-paid um, private equity or investment uh, sort of 
as hedge fund um, guy or as, as an asset manager, clearly that is attractive. Um, are, are there workarounds that are available? Are there are there opportunities for people to structure things in particular ways? There still are. Um, and I think, um, again, look, um, potentially um, this is something where Singapore may want to look at further clarifications and developments in the context of um, what has been done in Hong Kong and ensuring that there is that level of um, equivalence between the two jurisdictions now that Hong Kong has quite clearly stated that sort of carried in that they put in a sort of an exemption effectively for carried interest um, it, it, it will be interesting to see um, what happens over the next 12 to 24 months in this in this space and I think it also goes back to something that Kerry was saying around um, individual tax rates um, the wider policy initiatives, et cetera. So this is something that's got to be looked at in the rounds. We can't just look at carried interest as one it, it, in isolation. It's got to be as a broader package of measures when it comes to the taxation of um, sort of the, 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 the sort of the top 1%, top 5% of the population in Singapore. I and mean, Kerry, I don't know if you want to add anything extra from your perspective, um, given this is probably an area that you look at and discuss with yeah. regularly as well. So, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I think this is a this is really a very interesting one in terms of carried interest because I think that in general for Singapore, like what Ben mentioned, I mean, yes, there are ways, certain ways to structure it if you're if you're quick, um, you know, to take advantage of certain certain bits. Um, and um, sometimes if you have clarity, you know, some sometimes doors are closed, right? So um, it's a little bit of an interesting one at this point in time. And 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 certainly, um, while Hong Kong has indeed given some level of clarity. Um, there is also some level of grayness because it appears that there is a lot of criteria and conditions to be met. It's, it will have to be um, a lot of documentation and so on and so forth. And, and is that necessarily the same path that we want um, Singapore to go with? So, um, but I do think that with the, with the, uh, you know, with with the fanfare, etc., that has been, that has been, um, you know, uh, which which is now in in Hong Kong with with the carried interest, um, it's you know the the inland revenue or MES will be. Um, forced to have a look at it, I, I would say, yeah. But um, I, I think it, yeah, it'll be interesting to see which path they would, the, the in the revenue would go with, um, considering that we still want to definitely position Singapore as um, competitive from um, from that perspective. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks, Carrie, and th thanks, Ben. I definitely agree that the IRAs will have to take a look at this in the fu in the future. Uh, we do have another question from uh, Duncan, and I would maybe redirect this question to Ravi. Um, Duncan is saying that the uh, 11 billion of Singapore dollars set aside this year are significantly, significantly lower than the amount set, up, set aside last year. And do you think this can be taken as an indication of the confidence of the government that the economy will help itself to recover in 2021? Thanks for the question, Duncan. And, and yes, completely agree that the package this year is significantly smaller um, than, than the packages we saw last year. And I think that can be taken to mean that the government is cautiously, I emphasize a cautiously, cautiously optimistic about prospects in 2021. Um, you have the prime minister saying things like, you know, we're seeing signs of stabilization. You had the managing director from the monetary authority um, speaking a few months ago, saying that Singapore's prospects remain better than good. So I think that is echoed in the rhetoric that we've heard from uh, some senior ministers. I think it also helps that, you know, should there should further downside economic risk materialize and the tax revenues that Singapore expected are not generated, they do have buffer space to be able to, and, and levers to pull, to be able to try and pick the economy up again. Uh, they won't want to dive back into reserves um, more than what they're currently projecting for 2021, but it is a policy lever at their disposal. And then just to break it down on a sector by sector basis, I think, you know, the bigger drivers of growth that we saw last year, namely uh, manufacturing, um, telecoms, finance and, and insurance, they collectively re represent around 40 percent of GDP. I was reading the, the government's economic outlook for 2021, and they remain quite 
um, um, uh, optimistic about the prospects of those three uh, clusters, obviously representing quite a significant part of GDP. Some of the trends we saw um, uh, during the, the final half of 2020, they expect to continue with respect to things like um, semiconductors demand, uh, buoying the electronic sector, things like digitalization, di digitalization boosting the IT sector, the drive towards fintech and new kinds of payment processing, boosting the financial services sector. Um, so that's a big chunk of the economy, 40%. And then I think uh, the government, at least from its outlook, it thinks that the retail trade sector, the wholesale trade sector, again, collectively responsible for around 20% of GDP, will benefit from an improving labor market, a sort of uh, real wages pick up as um, unemployment ticks downwards. Again, um, these sectors, these consumer facing sectors will begin to see a faster recovery. So I think that 60% of, of the economy where the government is more optimistic. And then I think in those sectors where you know, quite clearly, they're going to still struggle um, for the next few months, at least. I'm talking about aerospace, aviation. The government believes that its fiscal package that it's putting in place is strong enough uh, to be able to help those sectors weather the storm. So in aviation, we have the extension of the JSS, the job support scheme. But on top of that, there's another um, aviation support package, which actually enable 50% of wage support through until September 2021. So I think all in, I think what, it, what the picture that, that, that emerges and I think the mentality that the government has um, as it approaches uh, the next financial year is one of cautious optimism. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Ravi. And uh, I think we are running out of time. And if there is no additional questions from our attendees, I will thanks again our uh, panelists today and give the word back to David for the conclusion. Thank you so very much indeed to all of our fabulous speakers, to, to Ravi, to Ben, to Kerry, thank you for your insights and for your views so quickly following the budget announcement earlier this week. And of course, to Salvatore, thank you so much for your time chairing today's session. We, we really do appreciate you all giving us your time uh, and of course to all of you in the audience for joining us as well. It would be remiss of me not to let you know about a few of the Chamber's fantastic webinars that are coming up. Um, we've got a really, really great set of events that are planned um, from our 2021 Asia Property Market Outlook, Leading Recovery, Why Asia is the will be the leapfrog in innovation and real estate, um, which is uh, next week. Um, we've also got an event on your Southeast Asia expansion, People Before Product, and we've got our fabulous International Women's Day uh, virtual conference happening again and um, starting on the 4th of March this year. We've got some really, really brilliant and um, brilliant speakers, some great content. Um, and there are still some supporting partnership opportunities available. So if you are interested in joining us on that journey, um, please do let me or the team know. Following today's session, you'll receive a feedback form, so please do fill that in. We do um, make sure we listen to all of your feedback to understand what you like and what you want to hear more of so that we can shape better content for you, our members, in the future. And that leaves me to say a final thank you to our speakers today. I really, really appreciate um, um, all of your time and your thoughts and your insight. Um, and the Chamber team look forward to welcoming all of the guests um, that are online today, uh, both members and non-members, and we hope to see you soon. So have a great evening and thanks to you again.